Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Net One UEPS Technologies Incorporated Quarter Four of 2020 Earnings Conference Call. All participants will be in listen early mode. There will be an opportunity to ask questions when prompted. For the benefit of the participants who have joined by the HD web phone, please ensure that you're given a microphone permission to make it audible before accessing the question queue. If you should need assistance during the call, please signal an operator by pressing star and then zero. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I'd now to hand the conference over to Mr. Drew Chopra. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Judith. Uh, welcome to our fourth quarter 2020 earnings call. With me today is our chairman, Jabu Mabuza, our CFO, Alex Smith, and our non-executive director, Ali Mazandarani. Our press release and supplementary investor presentation are available on our investor relations website, ir.net1.com. We will be referring to certain slides in the presentation during our prepared remarks. As a reminder, during this call, we will be making forward-looking statements, and I ask you to look at the cautionary language contained in our Form 10-K regarding the risks and uncertainties associated with forward-looking statements. In addition, during this call, we will be using certain non-GAAP financial measures, and we have provided a reconciliation of the GAAP measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measures. We will discuss our results in South African RAND, which is a non-GAAP measure. We analyze our results of operations in our press release in RAND to assist investors in understanding the underlying trends of our business. As you know, the company's results can be significantly affected by currency fluctuations between the U.S. dollar and the South African RAND. We will have a Q&A session following our prepared remarks. But with that, let me turn the call over to Jabu. Thank you, Drew. Uh, welcome uh, to the Net One Resort presentation for the quarter and financial year ended June 80, 2020. This being my first results as uh, chairman since taking on the role in July. The last, the last quarter has been a time of change and renewal at Net One. On the board, Net One welcomes three new directors in May team Anthony Paul, Ali Mazandarani, and myself. That was followed in June by the appointment of Mr. Cuban T. Lake and the resignation of four long-serving directors, being the former chairman Chris Seabrook, Paul Edwards, Alfred Mockett, and Alistair Payne. Then we take this opportunity to thank them for their service to NetOne over many years. We have also established a capital allocation committee that will be chaired by Anthony Ball, who is a highly accomplished investor in the private and public market. In addition to the board changes, we have had executive changes. Emen Kosse announced that he will be stepping down from the CEO role in September. Emen has spent 22 years with the group, on behalf of the Net One board, I would like to extend our sincere well wishes to Herman for his future endeavors. Our CFO, Alex Smith, will take over as interim CEO until the board finalizes the appointment of a permanent CEO. To ensure cohesion during this transition period, I have also set up a weekly chairman's meeting. Finally, on this theme of change and renewal, we have initiated a strategic review process during the last quarter. To ensure independence, the review was led by non-executive director Ali Mazenderani, who is an accomplished investor and operator in the financial technology business globally. During this presentation, Ali will share the key insights from this strategic review. All of this change and renewal has been driven by the goal of unlocking value for shareholders in this deeply undervalued company. Change is a journey rather than a single event. But we have taken the significant initial step over the very busy last quarter. I am excited to be part of this journey as chairman. I will now hand over to Alex 
to walk you through the Q4 financial and operation, operational results. Thank you, Jobu, and uh, good day to everyone. Uh, I hope that everyone is healthy and safe during these unprecedented times. We'll follow a slightly different format today where I, would, where I will address some of the operational, financial, and capital allocation topics. And then Ali will discuss our strategy, which was born out of the recently concluded strategic review. We will then op open up the call to Q&A. Before we dive in, I'd like to echo Jarvis' thanks to Herman. We're very grateful for his significant, significant contribution to NetOne over the years. During his tenure at NetOne, the company attained a number of significant milestones, and he leaves the business well capitalized with a solid platform for growth. Though the COVID-19 pandemic is global in nature, given the current mix of our operations, the most relevant and material impacts for NetOne are experienced in South Africa, and therefore limited parallels can be drawn between the trends in the US, Europe, and many other markets, and South Africa. Since the easing of restrictions in South Africa on the 1st of June 2020, however, our ability to operate our business has picked up meaningfully though it continues to be affected by the ongoing impact of the pandemic on the wider economy and the ability and willingness of people to move around South Africa freely. Despite these disruptions and restrictions, I'm proud of our employees who continue to serve our customers during this unprecedented time and would like to thank them for their tireless efforts. The key financial highlights for the fourth quarter of 2020 include in the fourth quarter, total revenue was $26 million, which was a 14% decrease year over year in uh, South African RAND, excluding the impact of the SASA implementation fee reversal in the last quarter of 2019. The decrease in revenue was due to the effect of the COVID pandemic on foregone fees and lower financial and value added sales, as well as, as, well as lower ad hoc technology sales and lower international processing volumes. The total quantifiable impact of COVID-19 on our adjusted EBITDA was 32 million Rand or $1.8 million during the quarter. The US dollar at 17.28 to the Rand in the fourth quarter of 2020 appreciated 22% against the South African Rand compared to the fourth quarter of 2019, which adversely impacted our reported results. The RAND has partially recovered to between 1650 and 17 over the past few weeks. The fourth quarter 2020 fundamental loss per share was 22 cents compared to $3.05 of fundamental loss per share a year ago. This compares to a fundamental loss per share in the third quarter of 11 cents. We reported an adjusted EBITDA loss from continuing operations of $12.2 million due to lower revenue in South Africa, higher losses internationally and the effects of the pandemic, and a $1.3 million Celsius inventory write-off. Excluding the net impact of the pandemic and once-off items, adjusted EBITDA loss would have been $9.1 million. By segment, South African transaction processing reported revenue of $14.2 million in the fourth quarter of 2020, down 9% compared with the fourth quarter of 2019, and down 20% from the third quarter of 2020, both on a constant currency basis, and largely due to the effects of COVID on transaction volumes and fees, including the two months when we were unable to charge for certain transaction fees during the lockdown. International transaction processing generated revenue from continuing operations of $1.4 million in the fourth quarter of 2020, which was down 12% compared to the fourth quarter of 2019, but up 3% versus the third quarter of 2020 on a constant currency basis. The year-over-year -year decrease in revenue in this segment was primarily due to an ongoing contraction in international transaction volumes. Lastly, financial inclusion and applied technology segment revenue from continuing operations was $12.6 million, down 13% compared to the fourth quarter of 2019, and down 20% compared to the third quarter of 2020, largely due to delayed technology sales and the unwinding of the loan book during the lockdown period, given new loan origination was severely curtailed in April and May, which resulted in a commensurate reduction in loan revenue and profits. 
Our cost base in South Africa remains relatively stable. During the quarter, we paid a $17.5 million termination fee in cash to cancel our option to acquire a further 35% interest in Bank Frick. Other material non-recurring items included a $7 million loss on the deconsolidation of CPS. Our equity accounted investments generated earnings of $1.1 million in the fourth quarter of fiscal 2020, down 33% compared with the prior year due to losses incurred by primarily V2 and carbon. At June 30, 2020, we had unrestricted cash of $218 million and no debt. US dollar denominated balances were $171 million out of the total. Our weighted average share count has remained relatively constant at 57.1 million shares during the fourth quarter of 2020. Moving on to some operational highlights, the number of active bank accounts remain relatively stable at a million. New account originations were also curtailed during the lockdown, and we have opened approximately 15,000 new FinBond bank accounts through June 30th, 2020. Our ATM network utilization declined by about 10% in April and May, as our branches were shut down during lockdown. However, we've seen a meaningful recovery starting in June, and in August 2020, transactions through our fixed and mobile ATMs were at or near two-year highs. Easy pay switching volumes and prepaid airtime and electricity sales were lower in the fourth quarter of 2020 as a result of the lockdown restrictions in April and May before partially recovering in June 2020. Nonetheless, easy pay revenue increased 4% year over year in constant currency as a result of bill payment revenue increasing by around 28% year over year, given the trend towards electronic payments and the signing up of new bill issues. As expected, our lending book unwound during April and May as we were unable to originate new business and our revenue from lending activities decreased in the fourth quarter of fiscal 2020 as a result. However, our lending book has recovered since restrictions were eased and the number of new loan originations increased from around 500 in April to 30,000 in May as a result of the new mobile loan origination channel and further to in excess of 130,000 loans in June 2020. The loan book finished June 2020 at 307 million rand largely in line with the end of the third quarter 2020 and indeed the fourth quarter 2019. Despite the challenging conditions in the broader economy, we have not observed any deterioration in the collection rates in the loan book. Our strategic investments had mixed fortunes during the pandemic and we continue to work closely with all of these partners. Some key highlights include Bank Frick delivered a strong performance in the quarter, benefiting from increased trading income and reported net income of 1.8 million Swiss francs in the first half of 2020. Finbond reported solid results for the year ended 29 February 2020 during our fourth quarter, but issued a trading statement in late June indicating that their earnings were likely to be more than 20% down in the half year to August 31, 2020 due to the effects of the pandemic on both their South African and North American operations. We continue to work closely with Finmond in terms of the rollout of new products and the provision of software and systems. Carbon had a difficult quarter as a result of the direct impact of the pandemic on Nigeria and their business directly. However, their rapid management action in the early stages of the lockdown protected the business and they have seen a steady recovery in lending levels and therefore revenue over the last couple of months while improving credit quality. MobiQuick saw a slowdown in revenue levels over the quarter, but has proactively managed its product mix to limit the impact on EBITDA. They are well placed to benefit from the pickup in activity as India emerges from the pandemic, and especially given their profile as an Indian owned and managed fintech business. They expect to return to pre-COVID revenue levels before the end of the calendar year, and then resume their growth path, which has seen them double revenue every 12 months or so, up until the onset of the pandemic. 
Celsi continues to make progress towards a critical recapitalization and remains on our balance sheet at a zero value. The underlying business itself is improving its operating performance and is undergoing a significant right-sizing exercise. However, the need remains for a recapitalization in order to achieve sustainability. But can now move on to capital allocation. A key feature of the strategic review process that has been undertaken and will be discussed by Ali later on this call is a focus on responsible and appropriate capital allocation. Following the various disposals concluded in the last financial year, the group has a substantial cash balance and an opportunity to rebuild a sustainable business while taking into account the expectations of stakeholders. As we previously disclosed, we are working towards formally determining our status under the Investment Company Act, which includes filing an application with the SEC relating to that determination. This process involves, amongst other things, analyzing the potential impact of our anticipated performance and revised strategic direction on our status under the Investment Company Act. We anticipate filing such application with the SEC in due course. Until we formally determine our status under the Investment Company Act, we do not believe we will be in a position to return capital to shareholders in an efficient manner unless in implementing our revised strategic direction it becomes clear that such a formal determination is no longer necessary. Lastly, I'd like to go over our thoughts about fiscal 2021. We've seen a meaningful improvement in various metrics since the effects of the severe lockdown were lifted on the 31st of May 2020. Our loan book in South Africa has recovered from its lows, fixed and mobile ATM utilization has improved, and bill payments continue to grow. Therefore, we do expect to see a sequential improvement in top and bottom line performance for the group, but in order to achieve a sustainable improvement and return to profitability for the company, we will need to see consistent progress on one, continued growth in the loan book, two, an increase in the number of bank and financial services customer, and three, reduced losses from our international businesses. We do intend to focus more intently on the South African market, and while we expect monthly EBITDA to turn positive during the course of the year, we believe it is prudent to get a few more months of data before we would be in a position to offer full year guidance or profitability targets for the full year. I'd now like to hand the call over to Ali to go over the net one strategy. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, as is my first time addressing the shareholders of net one, it's probably best to provide you a brief background before we get to the crux of the strategy review. I've been appointed to the board as a non-executive director in May 2020. In addition to my duties as a director, I'm also consulting to NetOne on its strategic review, and I'll continue to be involved in supporting the business through the implementation of that strategy. Prior to my role at NetOne, I spent the last decade investing in financial technology businesses around the world, in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, India, and Southeast Asia. Several of these businesses have grown into billion-dollar-plus market capitalization companies, and I have really seen the power of a strong value proposition that enables underserviced populations to access digital financial services. The evolution of the business over the past two years and the need to focus on our competencies form critical inputs in the strategic review process. One of the most notable recent developments was the establishment of a capital allocation committee of the board. I am, I am a member of that committee, and we are tasked with ensuring that shareholder funds in the business are allocated prudently. On a housekeeping note, I will refer to certain slides in the supplemental investor presentation, which has been posted on NetOne's investor relations site, and it will also be available on the webcast. I'll start with slide seven. What are NetOne's core competencies? When we commenced the strategy review, our first task was to identify NetOne's core competencies and where it has a clear right to win. The first of NetOne's core competencies is the provision of low-cost financial services to underserviced consumers. These include unsecured credit, transactional banking, and a digital wallet, insurance, and various, va various value-added services. The second is NetOne's unique ability 
to provide secure payment processing in offline and rural environments. In this area, Net One has proprietary technology in UEPS and a well-established payment processor in EasyPay, which is a market leader in parts of the bill payment ecosystem. Both of these competencies have been proven in the South African market. The common thread between them is competencies that enable underserved segments within both the consumer and merchant populations to access digital financial services. We also assess the geographic split of Net One's current consolidated operations following the disposal of the Korean operations. 96% of employees are in South Africa and 97% of revenues are generated in South Africa. So Net One today is primarily a South African business. On slide eight, I will want to preempt one question that we are likely to receive. Does this mean you are focusing on South Africa? The answer is yes. That is where Net One's current core competencies are, where Net One's staff and revenue are, and it also represents a sizable market opportunity with more than 150 billion rand of TAM, total addressable market. My experience has been that single country emerging markets payments companies can reach significant scale, and I think this is borne out by the several billion dollar plus payments businesses coming out of emerging markets from Brazil to Nigeria and Egypt to Bangladesh. Slide nine. South Africa is primarily a cash-based economy with approximately 60% of consumer retail transactions still being conducted in cash, similar to many other middle income countries. There are really two key points to take from that fact. First, there is a secular shift away from cash towards digital payment methods. South Africa is part of this shift and is in a similar phase of transition as other middle income countries. And second, there is still a lot of headroom for this tailwind to play out with cash still being 60% of transactions. On slide 10, the addressable market. Within that overall South African context, we looked at Net One's total addressable market or TAM based solely on its current competencies. We looked at the TAM in two broad categories, a consumer financial services TAM, which is estimated at approximately 57 billion rand or approximately 3.4 billion US dollars, and a merchant financial services TAM, which is estimated at approximately 104 billion rand or 6.2 billion US dollars. The conclusion therefore, is that Net One currently has the competencies and technologies to target two sizable addressable markets within South Africa with a combined TAM of 150 billion rand or over 9 billion US dollars. I'm now on slide 11, the characteristics of the addressable market. Our detailed analysis further determined that Net One is well positioned in the underserviced niches on both the consumer and merchant side. On the consumer side, Net One has the proven capabilities to provide credit, insurance, transactional banking, and wallet features to a bottom of the pyramid base that is underserved by other competitors in the financial services industry. On the merchant side, the underserved portion is the sizable SME or small medium enterprise and MSME or micro small medium enterprise markets, of which there are an estimated 700,000 formal merchants and 1.4 million informal merchants. Net One is well positioned to service both markets with the merchant side having particularly attractive secular growth characteristics. It is important to note that although I am talking of these two markets separately, the two offerings are often interlinked. It is quite rare to find a business like Net One that is already invested in the technology needed to provide most major payment services independently, whether issuing or acquiring all bill payments, at the same time as offering a range of financial services like lending and insurance. Slide 12 outlines a stylistic vision for Net One. We hope we try to bring this holistic offering to life on this slide using a single merchant as an illustrative example. Our research classifies an MSME as one that has sales of approximately 600,000 South African rand per annum. That is only 36,000 US dollars. So this is a small merchant. Today, these businesses primarily deal in cash. Providing a secure cash deposit process for them is an important use case, particularly with the security concerns in the South African market. 
Net One, with its existing fixed and mobile ATM infrastructure in underserviced areas, is well positioned to provide a version of this service. This is the cash deposit revenue stream at the top. In addition to supplying their existing cash business, Net One can also drive cross-sell opportunities and generate additional revenue from these merchants in two key areas. First, by allowing those merchants to accept digital payments, which in South Africa are mostly card payments at the moment, this would provide acquiring revenue to Net One. Second, is to enable the merchants to offer bill payments and value-added services like airtime and electricity sales. This leverages EasyPay's existing capability and provides additional revenue to both merchant and Net One. The offering I've just described is a traditional merchant offering. What is exciting is that Net One also has the capability to offer the merchant an EasyPay wallet or transactional bank account to store their funds and potentially to settle their funds in. This would provide issuing revenue to Net One. In addition, once you have the point of sale infrastructure in the field, you can bank the customer on your platform. You are able to provide lending and insurance products based on a solid understanding of the merchant's cash flow requirements and ability to repay. The combination of these services might be expected to result in a take rate of between 2% to 5% of total merchant spend. Simultaneously, the merchant benefits because when these services are provided as a package offering, there are efficiencies created. For example, a bill payments business where the offering is typically prepaid can be netted off against an acquiring offering where merchants are settled following a transaction, which can create a lower cost to sell, especially when leveraging the same infrastructure. The efficiency benefits of providing a bundled solution are also likely to help drive digital adoption faster as the economic case is more compelling. Slide 13 relates to NetOne's existing infrastructure. How do we make this, this full service offering a reality and what do we need? The short answer is that NetOne is already very well positioned and owns and controls many aspects of the distribution, infrastructure, technology and licenses. There are some gaps, for example, in the distribution in the MSME market, which is the point of sale terminal line under distribution infrastructure. However, NetOne has began to deploy point of sale devices in partnership with the South African bank in order to address this opportunity. The other gaps, which would be beneficial to fill to enhance NetOne's offering include a mutual banking license, which would enable NetOne to reduce its cost to serve across multiple payment streams from acquiring to ATMs, as well as to take deposits in its own right, and a fresh and relevant brand. So, in short, there is work to do in filling the key gaps, but NetOne, by and large, has the capabilities, technology, and infrastructure to make the strategic vision a reality. NetOne currently services both the consumer and merchant market, and has the capacity to bring the two offerings together to provide a holistic service. This would increase customer stickiness and significantly improve the unit economics. The prize of being the leading financial technology company in South Africa, targeting underserved customers is great if executed with focus and consistency. NetOne is better placed than any other business in the country to unlock that prize. We are looking forward to the journey ahead. With that operator, we're happy to open it up to Q&A. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, if you like ask a question, you're welcome to press star and then one on the touch tone further to keep that on your screen, at which time we'll hear a confirmation tone. Following this press, still placed in the question queue. For the benefit of the participants have joined by the HD web phone, please ensure that you give your microphone permission to make this up audible before accessing the question queue. If you decide the questions have been addressed and you wish to withdraw your question, you're welcome to press star then two and you touch your phone to remove yourself from the question queue. And just a reminder, you can ask a question, you're welcome to press star and then one. The first question comes from Raj Sharma of the Riley. Hello, good morning. Um, I, I have a few questions 
Um, just uh, starting off of Ali's uh, talking about the assets and technologies in South Africa um, in the businesses, are you missing any assets or technologies? Should, should we expect the company to make any acquisitions or, um, you know, does Net One largely have all um, that you need to, to grow your core business? And then I've got a couple others. Uh, so I guess um, uh, good, good morning. Uh, I guess I uh, sh should answer that. Uh, so Net One largely has all of the assets and technologies required to execute a, 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 upon the strategy. As I um, said, there is three areas that it could augment its capabilities in. One of those areas is in the last mile distribution in the micro merchant um, space. Uh, the other one is that there is a price and benefit if you are able to access um, uh, the national clearing um, uh, settlement arenas for acquiring ATM and um, uh, accept deposits, that would be facilitated by a, a mutual banking license. Um, I think that the third that I touched on was clearly a, 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 a relevant and, and fresh brand. I, I think that the, the, each of those, the first two predominantly, um, can be addressed by acquisition, but do not have to be addressed by acquisition. Um, right. And then just uh, going off of the, the need for a mutual banking license, does that play into the, the plan that you have um, to submit the filing with the SEC? Would that require additional capital? Could you, um, could you talk a little bit about that? Um, you know, if you were to, since you're proactively trying to satisfy um, the requirements of the Investment Act, um, what would that sort of imply? Um, would that mean, you know, you're going to take on more of a majority stake, or is there a plan that, you know, you would divest some of the minority investments? How does, can you help us uh, just understand how you foresee that playing out? So I, um just coming on this, Ali, um, I think um, if you, in the way the Investment Company Act classification works, obviously um, the more operating assets that we control, the better in terms of um, having a clear um, site of your classification under, investment, under the Investment Company Act. Um, so if we were to take control of another business, for example, it would um, push us into a better position um, in terms of that investment company act classification. That obviously depends on a multitude of variables, so it's not a, a straightforward um, calculation necessarily. But um, you know, at the moment, uh, under the investment company act, ca cash is regarded as a neutral asset, and if you can convert cash into controlled operating assets, then uh, that helps significantly in terms of how you're viewed under the investment company act. Is that right. so, uh, so, so does that, so does this imply, are you, uh, what does it tell you about your strategic direction? Uh, what does it tell us about your strategic direction? Is, does that mean you are trying to become an investment company? Um, you know, do you foresee that classification coming through? Or I'm just trying to understand what the, what the direction is, especially if you want to grow your South African business in um, most likely, possibly need the mutual banking license. Would that then fairly put you in the investment company category? No, it's more likely to assist us in making sure that we're not an investment company under the investment company act. Yeah. So the the plan is that you know we regard ourselves as a as an operational business, not an investment company, and um, investing in our South African business and lifting its its uh, fair value would would naturally help to fix the uh, investment company act dilemma that we have at the moment. 
Right. And can you uh, talk about the timeline for this process? Do you think that this, uh, how long do you think this takes the determination? Um, it's not really, there's no fixed uh, timelines, unfortunately. Um, so we can't really, unfortunately, give a lot of clarity on, on the timelines. Um, as we said, we're, we're in the process of submitting an application. Um, and uh, after that, as I understand it, it's really um, a process that um, the SEC will then run through. And as I said, there aren't any real uh, fixed timelines around it. Right. Thank you. And then uh, my my last question is, uh, what what did the strategic review? I guess yield. What did the strategic review yield um, in terms of the non-strategic assets? Um, you know, Moby Quick, Bank Freak, the the chief or the carbon. If not strategic, can investors assume that they would eventually be be divested? Ali, can you pick that up, or would you like me? Sure, to yeah, I'm, 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 happy, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, I mean, I think that the the most important change for the operations outside of South Africa is that the board has taken a decision uh, to exit the SIVO business. Um, the business um, has been significantly cash flow negative since inception and has incurred material operating losses. Um, and for the purposes of prudent capital allocation, the board deemed an exit of the business as the optimal path. Uh, we will look at all of our strategic investments in the coming months, but we have no specific plans for divestments of others. All of the um, other operations will be assessed on a, on a case by case basis. And, and in the same, on the same token, you might decide to, to up your stake in any specific um, non-strategic asset. Is that fair? That you might increase your investment or 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 divest some. So I mean, I think that the uh, the fact that we are focusing our interests. On South Africa, um, uh, and that that is our strategic priority, um, would mean that clearly it will be through that lens that the capital allocation committee will be looking at any potential opportunities. Got it. Got it. I'll, I'll take my questions. Uh, I'll, I'll take this offline. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question comes from. David Eberol of Salt Light Capital Management. Uh, hi, I uh, hope you can hear me. Yep. Okay, day. great. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the call. Um, yeah, maybe I could just just pry to pry a little bit just from the previous question. I mean, Finbond is uh, is publicly disclosed that they're looking to uh, sell the SA operations. Um, you know, how how is that? Now you, I'm kind of drawing the line here to your mutual banking license. And to, uh, how is it influencing, you know, your, your strategy going forward and your thinking going forward? Um, the second question I have is um, some of the other bank holding comp or holding companies of banks. Um, the regulator has, uh, has started to impose some extra regulatory burdens and perhaps capital burdens, which has meant they've spun off these banks. Um, have you had this? Uh, conversation with the, re the South African regulator um, that I guess is also, also filtering into this investment uh, holding company uh, criteria for the SEC. Um, has this also been an issue and has this come up in your thinking? Maybe you could elaborate on that. Thank you. Maybe just uh, just framing on the question a little bit. The, the um, reference to a mutual banking license is um, not a precondition of the, the strategy. It's not a necessary um, condition. Uh, uh, having a mutual banking license could provide uh, additional strategic benefits, but um, it's certainly not a gating item. Uh, just, to, to, just, just to contextualize um, uh, that. Uh, the path in which that could be pursued uh, there um, is is, is multifarious. There's, there's not one particular um, di direction of travel. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let um, uh, Alex make a comment. Yeah, if anything specific to say with respect to Finbond or the South African regulator? 
Yeah, look, we certainly haven't had any conversations with the regulator, and I think part of um, any decision that we make around a mutual banking license would include, you know, assessment of what are the associated costs and the regulatory um, requirements with that. So, um, you know, at this point, it's it's really too early to talk about um, how that might influence um, the situation. Um, you know, we do have a lot of regulated entities within the South African group anyway. Um, we have the insurance company, we have a couple of FSP licenses, so we're uh, not a stranger to the uh, regulated environment anyway. Okay, and so if, if Finbon is uh, looking to sell their, uh, their South African operations um, and you're not going to follow on, um, how does that impact your strategy? They're not having that kind of distribution base for credits. We don't really utilize their, um, their distribution base um, to originate credit at this point anyway. Um, we do have some sort of cooperation and collaboration arrangements, but um, they're relatively small in terms of, uh, and relatively recent. Um, and we really don't see them, uh, see those relationships as critical in terms of, uh, you know, growing our financial services business. Uh, and sorry, my last question. So then is that, then I, am I reading you correctly that uh, Finbon doesn't play a, a funding benefit to you nor a, a distribution benefit? What, then what could you maybe talk about what that benefit is? Are we talking about uh, Finbon today or? Yes, Finbon yeah. today. It, at the moment, we just have we have a um, an investment in a substantial investment in Finbond. Uh, we do collaborate in certain areas, um, as I said. Um, so there is a, a little bit of cross selling, but it's relatively small. We don't source any funding from Finbond, um, and we are providing some um, services and some uh, I, particularly IT services into Finbond. But no, there's no uh, there's no real. Um, uh, what's the right word, um, cross-benefits at this point in time with Finbond. Okay, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, just a reminder, if you have a question, you're welcome to press star and then one. The next question comes from Ernest Katzen of Katzen Equity Analysts. Thanks, guys, for the question. I hope you can hear me. You're very soft, Ernest. Okay. Um, Alex and Ali, thanks for the presentation. Really appreciate it. Two questions from my side. Number one, given that you're focusing on South Africa, would you be keeping your NASDAQ listing? And number two, with regards to the 150 billion rand odd of TAM, is most of that greenfield opportunity that hasn't been tapped or do you have to take market share away from others? Maybe um, I could yeah. start with uh, this is um, so, so I'll start with the second question. Um, the TAM that is represented there represents the TAM as it exists today. The um, green, so if you like, that pie um, uh, you would be taking from others. However, the total addressable opportunity, if you were to include um, the expected growth of the market as a consequence of digitization, would be a larger TAM. So you could generate revenue both um, by taking share and also by driving the market. Clearly, as Net One is also operating um, with underserviced customers, there is a material opportunity to drive the market. And in a lot of these verticals, there is limited competition. Um, in terms of the, um, uh, uh, the first question, um, Alex, I don't know if you want to have a go. Yeah, I mean, I, did, the, I don't think the NASDAQ listing uh, is up for discussion at all. I think we don't see any uh, change in, in, in that position at all. Thanks. Appreciate the answers. The next question comes from Nick Kricher of Signal Asset Managers. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, I have some questions on the restructuring of Cell C. You know, other investors 
are optimistic that they can recover some of the value, some of their investment. And I wanted to know how involved are you in the nego in, in the restructuring process of cell C and do you think you can recover some of the investment and do you have any timelines that you can guide us on when this will be completed? Um, I can take uh, those questions on uh, cell C. Uh, we are involved um, to a degree in terms of that we are obviously a 15% shareholder and have board representation at cell C, um, but we are not um, actively driving uh, that recapitalization process uh, from our side. Um, we're always hopeful that we'll be able to uh, recover something out of the original investment, but um, as you'll have seen from our financials, we've written that investment down uh, to zero. Um, you know, we certainly think there's a, a business there if we can get the capital structure right and um, that uh, then there would be value that would be realizable out of it. Um, in terms of timelines, I'm afraid I can't shed any uh, further light on, on, uh, on timelines other than uh, I know everyone is working very hard to uh, expedite that process and uh, complete it as quickly as possible. Um, I appreciate your answer, but I just want to push back a bit. Um, you know, everyone is obviously hoping to recover some money, but how realistic is that hope? Um, why, why are you hopeful? I think, um, you know, as I said, there is a, 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 core, a strong core business there, and uh, this, is a bit, this is more of a balance sheet structuring issue in terms of where CELC is, and uh, if, that, as a, if that balance sheet can be um, right-sized in terms of its structure, then um, there's no reason why the underlying performance can't come through and deliver some value. But as, a, as an equity holder, I mean, obviously we're thinking that the bondholders would take a quite a significant haircut, which means that the equity holders will be wiped out. Am I misunderstanding the restructuring process? Uh, why do you think equity will have value? So, you know, that'll, that'll all come out in the detail of the recapitalization when it's announced in terms of how that is structured. Um, you know, when you've written a company, when you've written an investment down to zero, um, you know, there's not a, that, that any sort of value would be uh, would be welcome. Okay, but you have, have you had any sight? The rumours that the the term sheets are out. Have you had any sight of? Um, you know, I'm Nick, hi. This is uh, Nick. Yeah. This is Drew. I, I think um, we're just clouding up uh, the call for the rest. So um, I would recommend you you know, uh, pointing these questions to either CELC or to Blue Label, because um, we would like to address some of the other areas. I think Alex has said what we can publicly. Yeah, I'm just trying to, you know, you guys are guys, it's an important part of, of the valuation process of the company. So, no, you know, it, it's valued at zero. So, um, no, no, we've that's, all, that's, that's the accountant's valuation. I mean, I need to, I, I need to determine the value whether we can recover any of that valuation. And I'm, I'm just asking, you know, there are other investors are very hopeful and I'm, I'm, you guys are hopeful. I'm just sort of know why you're so hopeful and whether you've had sight of it, any term sheets or anything like that. I, I think some of that borders on, on material non-public information, but I'm happy to have a conversation with you offline and, okay. um, and we can certainly facilitate a call with you and, and the Blue Label and, and CELC teams. Okay, thank you. Yep. The final question comes from PJ Solid of Potomac Capital Management. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for the strategic plans. Um, obviously, over, over time, if you're successful in Im implementing these plans and becoming a, uh, a profitable fintech company in a large market, um, you, you won't be valued uh, in, in terms of uh, half of cash and investments at that point. So, obviously, there should be some urgency to take advantage of the opportunity to, to implement a buyback and take advantage of that now. 
Um, I guess, can you share any more thoughts on that and any more thoughts on the timeline in terms of when was the SEC submission made? Is there any guidance and any dialogue back and forth, or do we just need to sit and wait? Hi, PJ. Um, unfortunately, there's, uh, there's very little sort of clarity we can give on uh, timelines. The, um, the application has not been formally submitted. I think it's, uh, it's uh, close, but uh, not um, actually um, submitted at this point. But, and then once we're in, uh, in and formally applied, then we don't really have a great deal of insight into how long it will take to, um, to get resolution on the matter. Um, so it's very difficult, unfortunately, to give you any guidance on on uh, timelines. But uh, we'll continue to, uh, you know, do all we need to do from our side to expedite the process. Uh, PJ, it's Drew. Just to time. add to that point. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add to what Alex was saying. So I mean, the, there's a parallel, right? There's one is the application and, and clarification from the SEC, which which Alex has addressed. But there's also the other side that if we build the business operationally, then we could self-cure that problem or drastically improve the ratios. And that is within our control, and that is where we're trying to focus on uh, in parallel. Okay. And is it realistic uh, to think that you could self-cure in the next couple of quarters here in calendar 2020? Or is that too aggressive? I think that's probably a little bit. Is, is, it, is it even possible? It's probably a little bit aggressive in terms of a self cure. I think we'd probably yeah. be into uh, third and fourth quarters of, of this fiscal. And the other route of uh, going through the SEC, you know, District Council tell you that calendar 2020 resolution could be a possibility in that route? Um, I think um, a remote possibility, I think, is, uh, is the advice at this point. Okay. And is there a scenario in, in talking to council as well where if you have the pathway and the visibility uh, on one or both of those pathways, um, that you could start some form of capital return before actually getting entirely there? We haven't had that uh, discussion yet with, with council. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the final question. Thank you for joining us on the d u EPS Technologies Incorporated conference call. You may now disconnect your line.